Before we get into the video, go ahead and check out my new podcast, The Diverse Mentality Podcast, where I give my take on news that's happening in hip hop, new music, and go over crazy stories in hip hop that nobody's heard about. I deliver two new episodes a week, and it's available on every single streaming platform from Spotify to Apple Podcasts and much more. So go ahead and check it out. The link is in the description below. Leave a like on this video. It helps it out a lot. And subscribe when you do. Turn on notifications as well so you can be notified of every single video I release. Also, follow me on Twitter and on Instagram at QuakeGW. And let's get into the video. Together to present the VMA for Earth Shattering Collaboration. Please welcome an Earth Shattering Collaboration. Actually, I don't like Kanye West till the end of this week. Okay. Because I've done number one, we can be friends again. <laughs> I want number one spot i will have it you know i'm this is what i'm going for and, and I, I want to beat the press i want to beat you know anybody that ever like tried to make me out to be just so crazy and so this and so that thank you you just add to the excitement see i know how to get it going don't i uh -huh. i tell you i'm gonna quit music and everybody wants to ask me questions <laughs> guys he hasn't sold a fraction of the material so we out here y'all know that y'all don't need me to tell you that 50 do not retire once my album sells and beats your album please do not retire What up guys, your boy Quake, and I'm back with a brand new episode of What Really Happened. If you're not familiar with the series, go ahead and check out episode one, where it's Eminem versus Michael Jackson. This series is basically the sister series of the Who Really Won. On the Who Really Won series, I focus on actual beefs and diss tracks that happen between artists, the more serious battles, but for the What Really Happened series, I focus on new battles and battles that didn't really have any diss tracks. It was mainly competition or disagreements between artists. So for episode two, because of it being September, I decided to focus in on September 11th, 2007, back when 50 Cent was going against Kanye West. As we know, this was not an actual beef, just a sales battle, and I really wanted to explore exactly what happened in this battle because there is a lot of behind the scenes stuff that a lot of people don't know about and never really found out about. Before we deep dive into the 50 Cent versus Kanye West battle in September of 2007, we got to talk about what was going on in the music industry around that time. Let's go to the year before that. Back in 2006, the music industry was in shambles. They didn't know how to sell records anymore. Albums were getting leaked prematurely and LimeWire was at its full scale. Everyone was illegally downloading music. Executives at that time at labels were running around like chickens with their head cut off because they couldn't figure out how to stop music from leaking and how to stop people from illegally downloading it because music was literally available everywhere for free. So they had to come up with tactics to try and sell records. They had success with shutting down Napster, so of course they ended up filing lawsuits against LimeWire, Mega Upload, and various other piracy networks that allowed people to download stuff for free. Keeping that in mind, in 2007, the music industry was expected to decline once again year after year like it did. 50 Cent himself was having issues with his own label Interscope Records and was having issues with his own artists. He had faced issues in 2005 with The Game, who was his former artist under g -Unit Records, then started facing issues with his own artist Young Buck in 2007. On top of that, g -Unit artists weren't selling like they were the first go around. Lloyd Banks ended up going double platinum on his first album, but on the second one barely went gold. The same thing happened with Young Buck. So 50 Cent was well aware that albums weren't selling like they used to. His first album, Get Rich or Die Trying, ended up selling 14 million records worldwide and did nearly 900,000 copies the first week. His second album did nearly 1.2 million copies within the first five days. He knew he couldn't match that, but he knew he had to do something to create hype around his album to hopefully sell a little bit more. 
Kanye West, on the other hand, had huge success with his first two albums as well. The College Dropout came out in 2004, debuting at number two, selling nearly 450,000 copies in its first week and going four times platinum. Then the following year in 2005, he dropped Late Registration. This debuted at number one and sold 860,000 copies within its first week, matching 50 Cent's first week sales of his debut album, Get Rich or Die Trying. And of course, this caught 50 Cent's attention. Although Kanye West was having huge success in his own career, he wasn't really acknowledged by hip-hop fans. Around this time, 50 Cent was essentially the face of hip-hop because hip-hop was mainly leaning towards gangster rap. And Kanye West was essentially the polar opposite. While rappers were mainly dressing in baggy clothes, had guns, and a very aggressive image, Kanye West was very clean cut. He had clothes that fit him. He wore backpacks. He just had a very different image than the average rapper. So these two artists going at each other in a sales battle couldn't be more polar opposites. So in 2007, both artists were gearing up to drop their third albums, and 50 Cent was the first artist to drop his first single off his album. In April of 2007, he premiered Straight to the Bank, which would be the first single off his album, Curtis, on Funk Master Flex's show on Hot 97. A couple weeks later, towards the end of April of 2007, he ended up premiering a new track called Fully Loaded Clip. This wasn't going to be a single, but it was going to be a track off his album, Curtis. Then on May 11th, 2007, Kanye West officially announced the release date for his new album, Graduation, and announced that it would be releasing on September 18th, 2007. He initially had a release date of sometime around October 2006, but said he was busy working on Common's seventh album, Finding Forever, and that he didn't have enough time to complete his own album. But a couple days later, on May 15th, 2007, he dropped the first single off the album called Can't Tell Me Nothing. But then a couple days later, he dropped the Can't Tell Me Nothing mixtape. And on this mixtape, in the intro, he announced that the album is actually coming in late August. In the same month of May, 50 Cent announced the second single off his album called Amusement Park on May 7th, 2007. In May, while 50 Cent was doing an interview for the BET Awards, he had announced that his new album, Curtis, is going to release on June 26th, 2007, the same day as the BET Awards. However, this release date would quickly change because 50 Cent felt like he needed more time to complete the album and felt like he wanted a release date that would coincide with a worldwide release because he is a huge worldwide artist. So on May 26, 2007, he announced that he's pushing back the album to September 4th. The first time they'll see me perform some records that um, off my new album, Curtis, is scheduled to release September 4th. It was actually originally scheduled to come out June 26, but that would have been the last date that I could have simultaneously re released my album worldwide. And because we missed that date, I mean, I said, let me push it back and make sure I do it right. You know, because I, I feel like I got an a, um, obligation to my fans worldwide. On the surface, it seemed like 50 wanted to push back the album to complete more tracks on the album and to have a worldwide release. But behind the scenes, things weren't going well with 50 Cent and Interscope Records because the first two singles, Straight to the Bank and Amusement Park, were not performing the way that 50 was used to in his career. And 50 had felt like Interscope Records weren't doing their part in promoting his singles, pushing them to radio. So the frustration with the singles not going the way they're supposed to, 50 had pushed the album back. Straight to the Bank debuted at number 32 on the Billboard Hot 100, but within just three weeks, it fell off the charts completely. And Amusement Park didn't even make it on the Hot 100 at all. And this was something that 50 Cent was not used to. Usually when he released the first or second single, he would be in the top 10, no problem. However, for Kanye West, things were going according to plan. And his first single, Can't Tell Me Nothing, debuted at number 80 on the Billboard Hot 100. But as the weeks went on, it went in the opposite direction as 50 Cent singles, and it started climbing the charts instead of falling off. And eventually, the song ended up peaking at number 41 on the Billboard Hot 100. In June of 2007, 50 Cent headed back into the studio and recorded eight new tracks for the album. 
he knew that he had to create new singles to generate better interest. I think the combination of I get money and AO technology will put me in the space that I need to be in with the public musically. You know, it's a big enough event, those two records together. Straight to the Bank and Amusement Park grew at the same, same pace of 100 spins a day. The average artist would be so happy to see their record grow at that pace. With me, I'm looking at it like, that's cool, but that's not what I'm actually looking for. So I'm looking for a response that like stops everything. And it's really exciting, that, that excitement, that energy that I felt during in the club. So I went back into the studio and created eight new songs. Out of that, first they've heard out of that batch is, I get it. And I, I'm getting that response that I'm looking for. So, you know, happy with it now. Although he kept pushing Amusement Park as a single and even performed it at the BET Awards in late June. Kanye West, on the other hand, geared up to drop his second single on June 27th, 2007, called Stronger. The label, though, didn't submit the track to radio stations for a while, so it didn't start charting until August. Then, on July 3rd, 2007, 50 Cent released the third single off his album called I Get Money. And with I Get Money, finally 50 Cent had a hit record that would work well to promote his album. The song ended up debuting at number 75 on the Billboard Hot 100, but ended up climbing up the charts as the weeks went on and eventually peaked at number 20 on the Billboard Hot 100. And the single had massive street success because every artist in hip hop at that time was freestyling over that track's instrumental from Snoop Dogg to Ludacris to Daddy Yankee and much more. However, on July 13th, 2007, Interscope Records had announced that 50 Cent's new album was pushed back another week, and this time it would be officially released on September 11th, 2007. Just a couple days later, on July 19th, 2007, Kanye West confirmed that his new album would be moving release dates once again from September 18th to September 11th the exact same day as 50 Cent's album. Now, when Kanye West wanted to change the date for his album to September 11th, he said he was facing backlash from not only the label, but from Jay-Z and everybody else around him. However, Kanye said he wants to embrace the competition and go up against 50 Cent, stating that it would be a great day for music because everybody would go out and buy albums and support whoever they wanted to support. And Jay-Z, who at that time was president of Def Jam, ultimately ended up agreeing with Kanye West, so they stuck to the September 11th release date, regardless of 50 Cent having that release date. A couple days later, 50 Cent appeared on Hot 97 talking to Funkmaster Flex, and Funkmaster Flex let him know that Kanye West is releasing on the same day as him. This is what 50 Cent said at that time. He said, I hope they see and understand what's getting ready to happen. I'm coming September 11th. If Kanye comes that day, he comes that day. That'll be great. I think his people are smart. I think he's smart too. I think they'll move the release date, but I'm coming September 11th. So just like that, it was official 50 Cent versus Kanye West on September 11th. 50 Cent and Kanye West were both confident in themselves that they could outsell each other. But 50 Cent behind the scenes was facing more issues with his own record label, Interscope Records. While 50 Cent was promoting I Get Money, and while that was climbing up the charts, Interscope ended up leaking his track AO Technology with Justin Timberlake and Timbaland. And of course, what this caused was that the budget for I Get Money was reduced drastically because the money had to go to AO Technology as well. So now you have a budget that was meant for one track, going to two tracks and of course this messed up 50 cents album rollout because this is not what he had intended to do this album i had to i threw straight to the bank out there and then amusement park was supposed to be the joint that they was going to assist me with going yeah, after true and then when that came it, it grew at the same pace that um, that straight to the bank grew and i was like yo it still don't feel like it's a difference in the support for the actual record so i had to go back in and create something different so when i came back with i get money it was like i was actually upset that ao technology league yeah yeah that kind of cut in into yeah i get know, money a little bit but then again it was like it was almost like it was, you had something for both audiences right at the yeah, same time, same time so. you, you know what's crazy it's like i knew for a fact that the record was leaking from innocent because the first two records straight to the bank and amusement park 
weren't playing at the station that played AO Technology first. Oh, okay. So that's an indication to me that they delivered it to Top 40 in the crossover before they sent it to Hot 97. Yeah, or, true, you know. true, yeah. So yeah. I was like, yo, like, that ain't like a regular leak, B. That's, Hold on this, yo. Yeah. yeah. At that time, Jimmy Iovine, who was the CEO of Interscope and running everything, voiced his frustrations to 50 Cent about him beefing with Interscope artists. At that time, Jadakiss was also signed to Interscope Records, and Jimmy Iovine didn't like the fact that 50 Cent was sabotaging other artists that were signed to Interscope Records. At the same time, like if I'm destroying it, I'm destroying something that's already in my building. Like it's already in Interscope. So Jimmy's looking like, 50, come on, listen, look. You want money? I'll give you my money. Just stop mm-hmm. destroying the artist. Okay. You see what I'm saying? You're just tearing it up. There's not going to be nothing here. Just you. While 50 Cent was facing label issues, Kanye West, on the other hand, was having everything go according to plan. The second single, Stronger, ended up finally getting submitted to radio stations and ended up debuting at number 47 on the Billboard Hot 100. And as the weeks went on, it ended up eventually peaking at number one on the Billboard Hot 100. Although these two were in competition with each other, they never got really disrespectful because these two actually worked with each other prior to even releasing any songs off their albums. Back in March of 2007, 50 Cent and Kanye West went into the studio and made music together. When 50 Cent was initially releasing his album back in April of 2007, he ended up mentioning Kanye West as a producer on the album. 50 Cent also says that when he was in the studio with Kanye West, he had heard his album and suggested that Kanye West released Can't Tell Me Nothing as the first single off the album, and ultimately that's what Kanye West ended up doing. Although as time went on, as we know, Kanye West was not a producer on the album, and the songs that they worked on together never ended up releasing. It was reported that Kanye West was also supposed to be on a 50 Cent track called I Don't Want to Talk About It, and that track eventually came out, but it was on the G-Unit album Terminate On Sight. I got a chance to work with all of the producers and sit down with them and see what they had to offer. I went in the studio with Kanye West, with Pharrell. Like Kanye West is a talented producer. In fact, I actually stopped by the studio to see if he could provide a different creative direction for myself. And I heard some of the material that he had at that point. I was like, wow, you know, some joints there, you know what I'm yeah. saying? Well, 50 said that Can't Tell Me Nothing was his favorite joint. Yeah. We went with Can't Tell Me Nothing first. And it worked. Now that there was an official competition, 50 Cent felt like he had to up the stakes because Kanye West wasn't doing enough. So then on August 10th, 2007, 50 Cent announced that he would be quitting music if he got outsold by Kanye West. He told the hip hop website SOHH.com that he wanted to raise the stakes. If Kanye sells more records than 50 Cent on September 11th, I'll no longer write music. I'll write music and work with my other artists, but I won't put out any more solo albums. And of course, this generated a lot more interest in the 50 Cent versus Kanye West sales battle because Kanye West wasn't getting disrespectful. He would rarely step out the box to promote the sales battle. He would just talk about 50 Cent a little bit, but not in a disrespectful way. 50 Cent, on the other hand, was getting disrespectful, wanted to go at Jay-Z a few times, and just overall decided to promote and hype up the sales battle so that more people would get interested in it. However, one day prior to him announcing that he would retire if he doesn't outsell Kanye, 50 Cent faced more issues with his label and his album's rollout. On August 9, 2007, the video with Robin Thicke called Follow My Lead, which was supposed to be the fifth single off the album, leaked online. And with nothing going right on this album, 50 Cent exploded. There were reports that at the G-Unit offices, he ripped out a plasma TV, he threw his cell phone through a glass window, and then he said that he was going to go on vacation. He ended up blaming Interscope Records for this because he said they leaked AO Technology, now they leaked his music video, and they weren't doing anything to properly promote his album. Like if you prioritize in a project, you would think that they would it would be kept a little a little more um how you say top secret? I didn't hear under wraps, top yeah, under secret. confidential, right? Yeah, yeah confidential. confidential. So it's like we'll have staff meetings and conference calls and everything and create a plan for the launch. Mm-hmm. And then the only person that leaves with the plan is 50 Cent. So the company's becoming more reactive than proactive, and right. that becomes frustrating. Right. And then like AO technology comes out on top of I get money. Right. So it has to be worked at two records on okay. two different formats at the same time. Then 
Follow My Lead comes out, the video in the song leaks. Right. I'm like, yo, what's going on right now, man? You know what I mean? I get really frustrated because you don't get a second shot at a first impression. There was a brighter light in this situation, though, because 50 Cent's AO Technology track was slowly climbing up the charts. Despite that, he let Interscope Records know how he feels exactly in every single interview. He was bashing Interscope Records, saying that they weren't being proactive, they were being reactive when it came to his career. He even dropped a new track with G-Unit called Southside. And on this track, he pretty much said, fuck Jimmy Iovine, who is the CEO of Interscope. So, Every so, time a nigga get out of line, so, I put him right so, back in line. So, Niggas so, think Jimmy Iovine my boss. So, so, nigga, fuck Jimmy Iovine, so, nigga. So, I'm from a hundred thirty fuck so, street, nigga. So, I ain't got no motherfuckers no one else. And recently you said some statements about Jimmy Iovine that was kind of harsh. Yeah, yeah. And, and the reason I think it's funny is, is if you say that about your boss, you, your boss usually checks you. Yeah, well, fire me then. <laughs> you see, you go call my boss and fire him. That's, fire me. that's not going to happen, but are you scared that, you know, they won't push the record as hard? Well, you know, I, I've experienced, like, the discomfort I experienced launching this project. Right. It's coming from uh, um, the actual company, and, like, you mm -hmm. know, like, we're dropping the ball all over the place. While 50 was battling with his own label, everything on Kanye West's side was going perfect. Jay-Z was pumping millions of dollars into Kanye West because he was the president of Def Jam Records at that time. Stronger as a single was climbing up the charts, and Kanye West geared up to drop his third single called Good Life featuring T-Pain. As the weeks got closer to September 11th, Kanye West and 50 Cent started doing media runs together. One of the first events where Kanye West and 50 Cent appeared together on stage was in Screamfest 2007, which occurred on August 22nd. During that concert event, Sierra brought out 50 Cent to perform their track, Can't Leave Him Alone, together. Then 50 Cent performed, I Get Money. After that, 50 had been scheduled to leave, but T.I. got on stage and brought out Jay-Z. At the time, T.I. called Jay-Z the king of New York, and Jay-Z was having a great moment because this event was actually in New York at Madison Square Garden. Everybody was praising Jay-Z, and 50 knew that Jay-Z was going to bring out Kanye West, and they were going to perform together to give great promotion for Kanye's album graduation. However, 50 saw that, got back on stage on Scream Fest, and Jay-Z didn't like it one bit. If you look at this video clip, you see Jay-Z is visibly upset when he sees 50 Cent coming back on stage and running around. Then Jay-Z brings out Kanye West, and 50 turns it into a moment of a bunch of artists on stage instead of just Kanye West and Jay-Z promoting his album. Diddy got on stage to his beats, 50, then everybody was on there, and it was a whole event. And you run up on stage when he's doing a little too much. <laughs> yeah. He didn't like that. Yeah, he didn't like that. He didn't like it. Tell, no, me, didn't. tell me again what he says to you when you run on the stage. You had to come up here, huh? <laughs> That's so yeah. great. Because he was going to have a moment. After this event, 50 and Kanye were roughly three weeks away from officially competing with each other on September 11th. Something happened on August 30th, 2007 that would shift things for 50 Cent completely. And once again, his label Interscope Records had something to do with it. 50 Cent's Curtis album, The Clean Version, ended up leaking online two weeks before its official release date. That means fans could listen to the clean version of the album top to bottom and at that time media outlets were prematurely claiming that Kanye West won because his album didn't leak online at all. After this a couple days later on September 6th 2007 Rolling Stone released their new issue of their magazine and on the cover was Kanye West and 50 Cent going head to head and as the days got closer to September 11th it was a huge massive event. Everywhere people would go people would ask who is going to win. 50 or Kanye and people would voice their opinions. Then on September 9th, 2007, the MTV Video Music Awards event was on and 50 and Kanye appeared on there multiple times. Kanye West had five different appearances. Meanwhile, 50 Cent only had two. Even though Kanye West performed on the VMAs and had great promotion, he didn't win a single award. So he voiced his opinion and said that he would never return to MTV. He was also upset that he didn't get to open up the VMAs like Britney Spears did, or he didn't get to close the show like Justin Timberlake did. MTV, tell them what the f I said. Five nominations, 
lost the Black Eyed Peas last year, man. I'm never coming to MTV. Y'all find Britney. Get Britney. Get a real fucking artist. Get Britney fucking Spears. Man, that's two years in a row, man. Get off this fucking man. I love this nigga, but man, God damn, man. Give me a chance, man. Give a black man a chance. I'm trying hard, man. I got the fucking number one record, man. I'm trying, man. I don't give a and the thing is, okay, y'all would think, yo, I, I might be upset about the awards because they nominated me for five awards and I ain't win nothing. And then Gold Digger wasn't nominated for Video of the Year last year. And in the rap category, I lost to Black Eyed Peas, my hump. So it's right. two years in a row at MTV where they come to me first mm -hmm. and they said, look, we got this idea for the sweets. Mm -hmm. I said, man, I don't like that idea. I don't, th I don't think the sweets has always been my dream when I first made Stronger to open the MTV Awards with Stronger. You know, I never opened the MTV Awards. You know, I've been playing my dude Jesus Walks mm -hmm. through the wire. Me and Jamie were gold digger. You know what I'm saying? Justin opened the awards. And you know, man, I'm, I'm just a heavy competitor. This year they opened with Britney mm -hmm. and they ended with Justin. Now, I got the number one song in the world, not the country. And MTV has played around the world. Right. They open with Britney and end it with Justin. I'm going to just say it to you like that. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to let people think about, I'm not, I'm not wording it no way. I'm not giving no opinions. I'm just saying what happened. The great white they, they, I'm, not, I'm just saying what happened. Right. They open with Britney, and yeah. I love Justin. Justin is my favorite artist out, you know what I'm saying, other than myself right now. And what they threw me, they threw me in sweets. They try, it's like the, the confinement. And what all I could do was walk through a crowd of people. I tried to do what I could do, mm -hmm. but put me on that stage. Give me the shot. The following day on September 10th, 2007, 50 Cent and Kanye West were supposed to appear on MTV's TRL, but 50 Cent was the only one that showed up because Kanye West was still upset at MTV, so 50 Cent ended up taking over the show. This was supposed to be my classic album, Get Rich or Die Trying. <laughs> right, right. Nah, 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 nah. Now that was supposed to be Kanye West, but he got, he got, I threw him off the show. Part of yeah. the problem, though, he's scared to be here with you? or Yeah, he's nervous. You think he had a problem with MTV? Nah, he knew he had to be here today. So he was like... <laughs> he said, yo, you don't want to give me no trophies? Okay, I'm not quit. The promo runs kept going, and 50 and Kanye started appearing at different places at different times, promoting their albums because the release day was officially here, September 11th, 2007. They ended up appearing on BET's 106 and Park, together but one thing happened behind the scenes that 50 cent even himself was surprised about when 50 cent and kanye west were set to perform on 106 and park 50 performed by himself with tony yeo being the hype man kanye west on the other hand performed a track called big brother and on that track he was showing love to jay-z and what ended up happening was jay-z showed up in support of kanye west he brought his big brother with him and his big brother ain't no competition for me. Kanye, how do you feel about that? You don't want to talk about your big brother like that? How do you feel about that? You know, I'm, 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 it's a lot, it's a lot of room over, it's a lot of room right over there, man. Yeah, where's big brother at? Oh, do we gotta call yeah. Jay? Where's yeah. big brother at? I think... 50 Cent highlights this moment in his book, Hustle Harder, Hustle Smarter. He said... I realized what I was up against in the weeks leading up to the release when Kanye and I both agreed to do joint appearances on BET. I had planned to bring Eminem with me, but BET told Interscope we couldn't have guests. Interscope said fine and told Eminem not to come. Then the day of the show, I get there and Jay-Z is performing with Kanye. So clearly Jay had gone to some length to get around the no guess rule, whereas Interscope had just let it go. They simply weren't as motivated as Jay. And at this point, 50 Cent had been deflated when it comes to releasing this album, when it comes to the promotion of this album, when it comes to his label. In an interview he did right after this 106 and Park event, he flew out to Springfield, Massachusetts, and an interviewer came up to him after he got off his flight, and they asked him how does he feel about the release of his album. And clearly in this interview, he sounds very deflated as if he's already lost. And publicly, he's never had an interview like this ever. And I've never seen him like this ever since. Regarding Kanye, there's no brawl there. That's, that's, is it a marketing hype? Well, it is a marketing hype on their point. You know, from their standpoint, from so as far as their company. So you're marketing for him, huh? 
Well, for this stamp, you, it's impossible. It's cross marketing. Mm -hmm. Every time I open my mouth, yeah, I didn't ask it. you to talk about Kanye. You asked me the question. Right. So I'm answering it, and it's like, and vice versa, they'll do the same thing to him. But when I've sold so many more records than he has, it's better for in their favor if you can change the public's perception of it. You know what I mean? I've seen uh, worse things pulled off. I'm not really excited to go sell a record. I probably won't even put another album out. If I do put it out, I probably won't go travel to promote it. Because this album, the actual release of this record, wasn't pleasant for me. The performance of it has me in a space where I'm still comfortable with saying I'll be number one. Do you feel burned out already? Well, not burned out. I just feel like I don't want to do it anymore. You know, it's the first time I ever told, you know, people publicly that I'm, I'm feeling this way for a while. So what are your next steps? You know, I don't know. I figured it out. Plus, it's comfortable. I'm in a space where I'm rich already. Talk to you later. And at this time, he added a bonus track called Smile I'm Leaving to worldwide audiences that purchased the Curtis album. And on this track, Smile I'm Leaving, he does sound defeated. He actually speaks his mind, talks about Jimmy Iovine, talks about Eminem, Dr. Dre. And personally, I think this track should have landed on the album. It's one of the best tracks he's ever recorded. Smile, nigga, my next album might be my last. Got what I came to get, the stacks and the stash. I took Jimmy Iovine ass to shut the fuck up. Got Drake on the city saying, and what's up? We done came this far. We can't stop now. M50 off the hook. He got to calm down. As the days went on, early projections for sales came out, and Kanye West was projected to sell 800,000 copies, while 50 Cent was projected to sell 600,000. And then on September 18th, 2007, the official numbers came in, and Kanye West debuted at number one with 957,000 copies sold the first week, and 50 Cent came in at number two with 691,000 copies sold. And just like that, Kanye West beat 50 Cent in sales in America. 50 Cent at that time was a huge artist and sold the most dominantly. There was nobody at that time that was selling like he was. So for that to happen was a huge surprise to everybody. Kanye West did not rub it in 50 Cent's face when he won. He said it feels overwhelming. He told the Associated Press as he walked into Def Jam's offices on Tuesday afternoon. He said everyone is coming up to me and telling me how proud they are of me. Jay-Z, who was the Def Jam president at that time, said we're not gloating. He's celebrating his win. In his mind, he believed he could win the whole time. 50 Cent said, I am very excited to have participated in one of the biggest album release weeks in the last two years. Collectively, we have sold hundreds of thousands of units in our debut week. This marks a great moment for hip-hop music, one that will go down in history. Jay-Z also said this is a great day for Kanye West and Rockefeller Records and a fantastic day for hip-hop and artistry. It's a good sign that heartfelt, sincere, and honest music can do these type of numbers. 50 Cent also accused Def Jam of purchasing copies from Kanye West's album. He said he's never had a fraction of the sales 50 Cent has. They could have only one scan and have it count four times. West's entire career hasn't sold half of what I sold on my first album. Even though 50 Cent lost in America, he ended up getting the number one spot worldwide in quite a few places. The official numbers aren't there, but he got the number one spot in Australia, the number one spot on the European albums chart on Billboard, the number one spot on Irish albums, the number one spot in New Zealand, the number one spot in Swiss albums, and many other places. However, Kanye West got the number one spot in the UK and the number one spot in Canada. 50 Cent and Kanye West both agreed that their album sales wouldn't have been as high if they didn't compete with each other. So ultimately, they both felt like they won. Like both of us, our numbers, like my numbers would have been lower if it wasn't 50. His numbers would have been lower. You know, we came together and did something really great for the industry. We combined for more than, you know, 1.5, you know, in sales in one week. And the biggest winner in this whole situation is Universal Records because that company owns Def Jam and Interscope Records. As far as singles go, the highest charting song from 50 Cent's Curtis album was AO Technology. That ended up peaking at number 5 on the Billboard Hot 100. Then I Get Money, which peaked at number 20 on the Billboard Hot 100. 
then straight to the bank, which peaked at number 32 on the Billboard Hot 100. And then finally, I'll Still Kill with Akon, which peaked at number 95 on the Billboard Hot 100. Initially, I'll Still Kill was not supposed to be a single. It was supposed to be Follow My Lead with Robin Thicke. But of course, that track leaked. And then Amusement Park didn't make it on the Hot 100 at all. Then for Kanye West's graduation, he had Can't Tell Me Nothing, which peaked at number 41 on the Billboard Hot 100. He had Stronger, which peaked at number 1 on the Billboard Hot 100. He had Good Life, which peaked at number 7 on the Billboard Hot 100. Then he had Flashing Lights, which peaked at number 29 on the Billboard Hot 100. And then the last single, Homecoming, which peaked at number 69 on the Billboard Hot 100. After this battle, most of the world viewed it like this, that Kanye West had forever shifted hip-hop and that a new era of hip-hop was coming in and that the old gangster rap era was going out. Now that's a debate I'm going to have for a totally different video, but 50 Cent voices his opinion on the whole 50 versus Kanye West era in his book, Hustle Harder, Hustle Smarter, and points out that his label sabotaged him when it comes to the release of his album. He said, our battle took place in 2007 when Kanye West's third album, Graduation, was due to come out a week after my third album, Curtis. When I saw that the dates were so close to each other, I realized that we had a chance to do something special by turning our releases into a head-to-head -head competition. I pitched Kanye on the concept of us dropping the same day. Being an independent thinker himself, Kanye saw the value in my vision and agreed to move his release up. He understood we could collectively generate much more buzz by hyping up our battle than being out in individual promo runs. The media loves a spectacle and a few things more of a show than Kanye and me going head to head. We both played it for all it was worth doing appearances together and adopting the role of two prize fighters before a big fight. To be clear, there was no actual beef between us. Kanye had never expressed any discomfort about the success I'd had, and I respected him as an artist. It was truly just a case of two people being comfortable with the concept of competing against each other. Personally, I knew that competition was what I needed at that point in my career. I was in the most vulnerable state as an artist can reach, confusion. So much had happened to me in such a period of time that I had lost touch with my sense of self. Competition would help me take me back to my roots. In order to regain that spark, I even moved back to my grandmother's house in Queens for a bit so I could soak up some of that old energy. Kanye was a different point in his career at that time, but he took the competition just as seriously as I did. In the weeks leading up to the release, he locked himself away in his studio, redoing mixes and trying to make his album sound as tight as possible. He reportedly mixed stronger over 50 times before he was finally satisfied. Neither of us were treating it like a stunt. Both of us were playing to win. In the end, Kanye took home the gold. Graduation sold 957,000 units in the first week, while Curtis moved 691. It marked the first time two artists had moved over 600,000 units in the same week since 1991. Today, selling 691,000 units your first week would be considered a massive success. But at the time, the narrative was that Kanye had soundly defeated me. Of course, he did beat me. But what the public couldn't see was that I'd still earned a major victory. The truth was, by the time Curtis was ready to drop, Interscope was already starting to pull back from me. I was in the green with them financially, as my first two albums had each sold a combined 20 million copies. But despite that success, it was still their discretion whether to continue spending marketing dollars on me despite all of my success. They decided to slow down the cash flow. Even more damaging than holding back on marketing dollars, they were undercutting my promotional strategy for the album. My plan had been to build up a street buzz with the song Straight to the Bank, which spoke to my core audience. Once that song was bubbling a bit, my idea was to release Amusement Park, which had more of a pop feel. It was the same strategy that I used when I released Wangsta before in the club. Get your core audience engaged first, and then drop something for a wider audience. Interscope should have supported my plan. It had worked in the past, but when Amusement Park did not hit number one as fast as they expected, they started to second-guess the strategy that threw off the energy I was trying to build. To make matters even worse, when the record went to print, the whole album leaked prematurely. Those records should have come out after Curtis dropped instead of the weeks leading up to it. 
Once those leaks happened, I was in a bad spot. The public was none the wiser, but I knew Interscope had severely damaged my launch. Thankfully, I knew just what to do. Instead of sitting around moaning about my label, I took matters into my own hands, just like I had seven years earlier when Columbia was dropping the ball. I created a competition that would generate the buzz my label wasn't capable of creating. Even worse, I was competing against an artist whose label was doing everything, and I mean everything, to make sure he beat me. Jimmy Iovine might not have cared about beating Kanye, but Jay-Z, who was the head of Def Jam at the time, damn sure cared about beating me. Jay had been extremely uncomfortable with my run in New York City for years, so he did everything under the sun to make sure he could beat me through Kanye. And as the years went on, 50 Cent faced more issues with his label and ultimately had beef with Jimmy Iovine himself. And at one point, 50 Cent says, when they had a meeting, Jimmy Iovine told 50 Cent in front of his face that he did not like him and that he should be out of music and he should focus on on movies and television. Like Jimmy, me and Jimmy, I don't even know where the disconnect happened. Mm -hmm. I know where, where my actual issues with him were created from, but for him, like he, he we had a communication, we, we spoke to each other and he expressed that he didn't like me. You see what personally. I'm saying? Personally. Right. So, and, he, and, he, and he didn't go around and tell it to somebody. He, he, he told, told me. He yeah. told you personally. Yeah. So I mean, for now. Oh, you on the phone and he. No, nah, we was, we was. Face to face, we was talking. Kept it on. See, you know what? I, 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 you know what? I, you respect that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like you know, what happened is sometimes, like him and Steve Berman at points, they go, oh, like they, they get defensive before I can actually say something. They think I'm getting ready to say, like I've said things. You say why he didn't like you, Jimmy Ivy? Well, I mean, well, it's it, it it stems from his passion for beats. I don't dislike Fifty Cent. Not never stopped liking Fifty Cent at whatsoever. He came to my office, and this is what I said. I said, 50, I'm not even sure if I like you, but I'm, because he wishes to give me a hard time. I said, but I'm gonna give you a great idea. You need to get into television. And he recently has said that day that I said that to him is one of the days that inspired him to do television. But it was, a, it was meant more as a joke. He said, I said, I don't like you. I said, no, no, no. I said, I'm not. I'm not sure if I even like you because he's one of those guys that just, you know, drive you nuts. But I, I dig him, man. I, 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 we had a lot of success together. When I have a lot of success with somebody, I'm not going to dislike them. There's no chance. He's a funny guy. And as the years went on, that's exactly what 50 Cent ended up doing. He ended up releasing Before I Self-Destruct, which was his final album requirement for Interscope Records, and then ultimately stopped focusing on music and started developing G-Unit film and television. And right now, he's doing an absolute amazing job with power, killing it on stars. He has a new BMF series coming, and so on and so forth. He's focused on a totally different aspect in his career. Now, when it comes to Kanye West, he's still dominating in music, and he's still having sales battles, because right now, he's going against Drake, and they're going back and forth in terms of who's the best and biggest hip-hop artist out. And of course... He did crazy numbers with Donda. It did well over 350,000 copies the first week, which is great numbers for today's time. And it's the second best-selling album of this year so far as of the making of this video. And of course, he's killing it in the fashion world as well. Yeezy as a company is a multi-billion dollar company, and Kanye West himself is a billionaire. There was always an underlining story when it comes to this 50 Cent versus Kanye West battle, and to me, it was about taming 50 Cent as a person. He was simply just too loose. He would do anything he wanted, and at one point was one of the most powerful artists in the world. And I think label executives was looking at 50 Cent like he was getting too powerful and way too loose and out of control, and they just simply couldn't tame him. So they came up with a way to make him lose all that power that he once had. Let's remember, in 2005, he was going at roughly 10 artists at once, and at one point decided to call himself Curtis Interscope Jackson. Around that time, he was also making up about 80% of the successful black music coming out of Interscope. So you can imagine how much power he had at that time, and of course, him going out and just doing whatever he wanted was not the way to handle things, and that's not the way that labels were used to dealing with artists. Normally, they could tame them, control them through contracts, but 50 Cent was a whole different animal. Now, this is in no way to take away credit from Kanye West's great success. 
That album, Graduation, is arguably one of the best hip-hop albums of all time. To me personally, it's my favorite Kanye West album of all time. So in no way am I discrediting Kanye West's win or success here. He's a billionaire now. He's succeeding in music consistently over and over again. So there's no shot to Kanye when I'm talking about this. There was just more underlining stories in this whole battle that I feel like most people had no idea about. And I'm currently working on 50 Cent versus Jay-Z, and it links really well to this 50 versus Kanye video. So if you guys want to see that video, go ahead and drop a like, leave a comment below, and just share this video. When I see crazy support for it, I'll drop the video as quickly as possible. 50 Cent and Kanye West are both doing amazing in their careers, both dominating in the fields that they've gone into. And this sales battle that they created back in September of 2007 will forever be marked in music history, not just hip hop, but music history because it was a huge sales week and it was super entertaining. And I wish more artists would do something like this because we've never seen anything like this before it or after it. With that being said, that's it for this episode of What Really Happened. What do you guys think of the 50 Cent versus Kanye West battle? Did you guys know all about this information? And which album at that time did you purchase if you participated in the sales battle? Also, which album do you prefer overall? Let me know in the comments below. I'd love to check them out. That's it for today's video. If you guys want to support this channel further, you can do so at patreon.com backslash diverse mentality for just a dollar a month or more. You can help support this channel further. A link is in the description below. Like, comment, share, and definitely subscribe. I do videos like this daily on hip hop news and much more. So definitely subscribe. Follow me on Twitter and on Instagram at QuakeGW. Like us on Facebook, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.